Michael, thank you for that exhortation to live to, uh, to the glory of God. Uh, God willing, next week, um, I want to I want to expand on that because um, as we as we come to the end of First Corinthians ten, which we'll we'll talk about in a minute, um, verse thirty one so says it says so whether you eat or drink or, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And I want to I want to drill down on that next week just to kind of give you a little hint today. Um, we talk about living for the glory of God. To me, uh, that generates a number of questions. What is the glory of God? How do we, how, how do we determine that? What does it mean uh, to live for the glory of God? How do we do that practically? Uh, so, so I really want to spend some time uh, next week going over that with you. Um, and it's not just raising your hand and saying, glory to God. We, we need to understand what we're really doing. And, uh, and it's been very profitable for me to undertake that study, and I hope it'll be profitable for you too. So um, today we're going to, we're going to review uh, 1 Corinthians 10, verses 23 and following. Let's pray first. Lord, You have so much for us in your word. We thank you for putting your Holy Spirit in us, illuminating your word through him, giving us the power to obey it through him. Lord, we we don't want to just read and forget. We want to be changed by your word. We want to be convicted, encouraged, exhorted, Lord, whatever work you want to do in us, do it for your glory. Get me out of the way. Speak clearly through me, Lord, so that your people can be edified. I ask this for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So let's, um, let's back up to verse 23. We actually um, left off in verse 24, but let's read the passage again from verse 23. <laughs> Uh, to actually um, the first verse in chapter 11. And I'm reading from the NIV. <clears throat> Excuse me. Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. Nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. And that, just to pause for a second, that, that, uh, that is probably an encapsulating verse for the entire the entire last three or four chapters that we've, we've worked through. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If some, believer invi- if some unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. But if anyone says to you, this has been offered to sacrifice, then do not eat it, both for the sake of the man who told you and for, the consci- and for conscience' sake, the other man's conscience, I mean not yours. For why should my freedom be judged by another's conscience? If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the Church of God, even as I try to please everybody in every way. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of the many, so they may be saved. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. So the the theme, uh, limit your liberty with love, continues, and... um, and it's important for us to uh, to review a little bit where we where we left off. Four points, five points. Corporately and individually, we are the dwelling place of God. If any man destroys the temple of God, instead of building up, God will destroy him. That's a that's a solemn a solemn warning from Scripture. 
building others and the unity of the body is more pleasing to God than gratifying yourself. Refraining from exercising liberty must be voluntary, not coerced. Have compassion and understanding, not judgment, and teach the weaker brother or sister. And then finally, God will judge each person's work. So this whole concept that we've been, we've been belaboring for weeks and weeks and weeks of limiting liberty with love boils down to, to one thing, just the command to uh, love others as yourself. Uh, and then, of course, there are other commands that say, consider others more important than yourself. Uh, and that's what we're going to look at today. So obedience to this command to love others as yourself, of course, is not, is not based on the loveliness or worthiness of the other person. Of course, Christ is our example. While we were still sinners, radically depraved, he died for us who would believe in him. He died for us who would believe in him, trusting in his work on the cross. He came down to our level to serve and save us. And if you can turn to the second chapter of Philippians for me, we're going we're gonna to examine uh, an explanation of Christ's attitude, example, and work. And we, we got into this a couple of weeks ago. Um, but it, uh, as Peter says, you know, as long as I'm with you, I want to remind you of these things. So... Um, Second chapter of Philippians. Therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united, and that's what he's doing. He's calling for unity of spirit, intent on one purpose. Again, do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also the interests of others. Have this, and this is, this is the key, have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him, because he humbled himself. God highly exalted him, and he died on the cross. God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, again, to the glory of God the Father. Pastor Michael did a, did a great exposition of this passage, what, three, four weeks ago? Uh, so you can, you can pull that up if you want to get a little bit deeper exposition of that passage. I'd recommend you do that. So we're talking about Christ condescending out of concern for others, we're to have concern for others more important than concern for ourselves. Christ is our perfect example in that. And Christ makes a powerful summary illustration about condescending to serve others in Matthew 18, 1 and following. And some parallel verses, and you can be turning there. 18, 1, Matthew 18, 1. And, and, and the context here, the setting is, this is after the Mount of Transfiguration, um, Jesus' glory is, is revealed. And after they return from the mountain and, uh, and the, the disciples are having a hard time casting out a particular demon, so Jesus does it and explains, you know, this particular one only comes out by prayer and fasting. So he, is, he, is, um, uh, he had brought them to the top of the mountain and then he's saying, no, you guys are still not understanding. And, and at that time, coming back from the mountain, they are arguing about who will be the greatest in the kingdom of God. When Matthew 18 starts out, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And they were arguing about that. 
He called a child to himself and set him before them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so this has nothing to do with innocence of that child. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So he's saying instead of arguing about these things, humble yourself. Whoever receives one child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. So we've been, we've been talking for the last few chapters a lot about causing people to stumble, and we're going um, we're gonna to address that in a little more detail. What does it mean um, to stumble? And... Um, and why is it important that Jesus brought forward a little child as a picture of um, co condescending to serve one of the weakest and lowest members of the society? So I want to talk about the, the stumble first. We've used it a lot, stumble or stumbling block in the last few chapters. And I, and I, I confess to you that in the past, I've kind of conceptualized a stumbling block as something that, uh, yeah, it's there, and there's a potential that you might stumble over it, but it's kind of passive. It's just in the path, and you got to watch where you're going, and you won't stumble over it. Okay, it was kind of a passive picture in my mind, and I and I confess to you that I was that that conception was wrong. Okay. Um, the word translated stumble or stumbling block is an interesting one. It's the Greek word scandal, on which I think Michael mentioned, from which we get our English word scandal. And uh, Miriam Webster has five definitions for the word scandal. And the first one is what we usually think about in our culture as a scandal, a circumstance or action that offends propriety or established moral conceptions or disgraces those associated with. Okay with it. And then, and then when we think about what we consider to be scandals, uh, and I don't have to go through the list, but there's enough of them out there that you can think of some. But the fifth definition, which is the least used, is conduct that causes or encourages a lapse of faith or of religious obedience in another. Okay? And that's much, much closer to the Greek. Um, the Greek root, and this is interesting, stick with me, was um, the, the name of the part of a trap to which bait was attached. And then it got broadened to, okay, the trap or the snare itself. So you think about, you think about a trap, okay, um, even a mouse trap. There's some bait in there which calls the person or thing or animal that you're trying to trap, it calls them in. It's not, it's not passive. Even, even a mouse trap sitting in your garage is not passive. It might look passive, but it's, uh, I mean, there's smells going out calling those little mousies into it. So, so we need to remember that, that a stumbling stone is something placed purposely to cause sin. Um, Romans 11, 7 through 9. What then is an example? What, what Israel is seeking, it has not obtained, but those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. Just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor. Okay? So there's something intentional here. Eyes to see not and ears to hear not, down to this very day. David says, let their table become a snare, a trap, and a stumbling block and retribution to them. So that's a, that's a great passage that, that connects a, a snare, which is active, and a, and a trap, which is active, and a, and a stumbling block and retribution to them. Um, and we see another, another great picture in Revelation 2.12, where we see that Balaam's plan was an active trap for Israel, not a passive stumbling block. And Jesus, dictating his letter to John, says, 
in verse, verse 12, and to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name, and did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one who was killed among you where Satan dwells. So he's saying, you're in a tough place, but you're doing, you're doing good, but I have a few things against you, because you have, there, you have there some who hold to the teaching of Balaam, and you can go back and, and research Balaam if you want to, but it's not necessary at this point, who kept teach, Balaam kept teaching Balak, the king who had hired him, to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things, sacrifice to idols, and commit acts of idolatry. So, so it was... Okay, Balak called Balaam to curse the Jews. Okay, an active, um, an active cursing, not just a, not just a passive, you know, set up a set up a rock in the street and see if one of the chariot wheels breaks on it. No, no, this was active, and and we see it um, in Matthew sixteen twenty one to twenty three. The Messiah, Jesus heard in the words of Peter a snare laid for him by Satan. Verse 21, From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and be raised up on the third day. So he's explaining this to his, to his apostles, what's going to happen within the next few days. Peter took him aside. Lord, Thank you for the example of Peter and uh, that we realize that even if we are presumptuous and foolish and stand in the way of the will of God, you forgive. So Peter took him aside, began to rebuke him. God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block. Some versions say the word snare. For you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. So Jesus is saying, Satan speaking through Peter is intentionally setting a snare for him. Not just something that someone might stumble over, but it's, it's active and it's intentional to cause people to fall. In, in the Hebrew, the tense of the verse has the cause of causing one to stumble, not just setting up a situation where they might stumble. And I'm belaboring this because maybe I need to hear it, but, but when you hear stumbling block, it's, it has the sense of intentionality to it. Um, Proverbs 4, 14 and following. Do not enter the path of the wicked. Do not proceed in the way of evil men. So wicked, evil, avoid it. Do not pass by it. Turn away from it and pass on. For they cannot sleep unless they do evil. They are robbed of sleep unless they make someone stumble. Malachi 2, 7 and 8, in cursing wicked priests, Yahweh says, For the lips of a priest should preserve knowledge. Men should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of Yahweh of hosts. But as for you, the wicked priests at that time, you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by the instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says Yahweh of hosts. So we can see the, the purposefulness of the plan of God in making Christ a stumbling stone, which, I mean, What an example of a, I mean, do you think of Christ as a stumbling stone? I mean, that, that's what scriptures say, and that's what we're going to read. Because it was purposeful on the part of God. Romans 9.33, he's quoting Isaiah 28.16 here. He says, just as it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Okay. And he who believes in him will not be shaken. So, so Christ, the stumbling stone, is calling for belief, but is also there, as we'll see in 1 Peter 2.8, 
It says, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, for they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were also appointed. Okay, so Christ came uh, in, the, in the will of God to separate those who, who are tempted and in fact uh, do stumble into sin, commit sin, and those who, who are chosen uh, to, to not commit sin, who see Christ and obey him rather than, rather than experience the doom to which the others are appointed. So, in most verses, the concept of placing a stumbling stone is actively setting a trap by which someone may be caught in their sinful temptation. So, w- when, when Paul talks about, you know, don't, don't eat meat that may cause your weaker brother to stumble, um, he's saying, if you do that, you're being intentional. Okay, that's why he's teaching this. He's saying, don't, don't be intentional about causing a weaker brother to stumble. Um, a trap is placed for a purpose. A trap has something attractive in it. For a mouse, it would be nuts and seeds, the same for a bird. For a lion, it would be a, a, a piece of meat. We understand that not all animals or people are attracted to the same things. So the question for us is, what sort of thing would be placed in a trap for Christians? That we have to be very aware of. Jesus makes it clear in his rebuke to Peter, where he says, you're not thinking of the things of God, you're thinking of as, as man thinks. People are constantly tempted to place their interests above the interests of God, especially when they're in need or think they need something like pleasure, health, money, respect, honor, possessions. Jesus, our example, perfect example, tempted in every way just as we are, but without sin. And you think about um, the snare that Satan laid for him in the wilderness with the with the, um, the, the exhortations that he gave to Jesus. Hey, if you're God, why don't you just make these stones into bread? Hey, and Satan knew that Jesus was weak at that point. He was setting a trap with the most attractive bait that he could think of at the time, which was food. Um, and, and, and that food would, would, in fact, satisfy Jesus' bodily need. But Jesus focused on the interest of his father putting his father's word before his need for food. He recognized the traps laid before him, not just in the wilderness, but all through the Gospels. What we see is the, 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 the chief priests, the Pharisees, the scribes constantly lay, lay traps for him to fall into, to cause him to do something against the law. And, and Jesus, because he is tempted in all ways, just as we are, but without sin, avoided all those traps. But we're called to not set traps for our brothers and sisters. So, we talked about a child as a picture of the weakest among us. Let's talk some more about a child. Matthew 18, 3 makes clear the lowly position of a child. And he says, Jesus says, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, humble and dependent, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child will be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Who welcome wel- whoever welcomes such a child in my name welcomes me. So, what's the picture here? The, the word welcome or receive meant uh, to receive into one's family in order to bring up and educate, in a sense, uh, to, to adopt that person. So, God is taking us helpless, of no account, with no rights, into his family. We're challenged to do the same for those in lowly positions, weaker brothers and sisters. Children at that time and in that place, and and in some places today, were to be seen and not heard. They were loved, but they had no rights or privilege under the law. And, and just as an aside, that's one of the things that makes the the, the story of the prodigal son so... Um, uh, so striking that that this son realized he had no right, he had no privilege to ask his father what he asked him, and yet and yet God, the Father in this parable, was was gracious and said, "Okay, let's see what you do with this." Um, 
Children were condescended to, but the thought of serving them was a strange teaching. So being a servant of a child, which Christ is calling them to do, goes against societal norms. This would be an extremely stern rebuke to the disciples, especially after they were arguing about who would be the greatest. So bottom line, a humble, godly person does not concern himself with positions of power, but is concerned about active service, especially to the most needy, and that's what that's what we're constantly called for here. Okay. Verse 25. It says, Eat anything sold in the, in the meat market without raising questions of conscience, for the earth is the Lord, everything in it. Um, so so don't, don't ask uh, with, the, you know, with the understanding that it's possible that this meat was offered to idols, because he's saying that God has made everything clean. Don't, don't worry about it. Um, Jewish thought at the time was that if you don't know you're sinning, that those sins were considered to be light. Uh, and, and in a number of places in, in, in the Hebrew writings, it talks, about, it talks about intentional sin and unintentional sin and being treated differently. But Paul is saying, don't even think about it. What you don't know won't hurt you. If you think about it, you may be setting up an unnecessarily struggle in, an unnecessary struggle in your own conscience. Here's a place where it's wise to say, I'd rather not know. Why set up a potential struggle? So um, Paul, Paul kind of wraps it up uh, in, a, in a parallel thought passage, Romans 14, 19. He says, I'm convinced in the Lord that nothing is unclean in itself. But to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. And this is this passage goes way beyond the thought of food. We'll explain that in a second. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. It's a trap for him. The faith which you have has of your own con- have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith, and whatever is not from faith is sin. That that um, that passage it has a broad, broad, broad application in our life. It's just not about food. If we think, I remember a few weeks ago in the men's group, um, uh, we were discussing, how, in effect, how long can you look at an attractive woman without it being sin? Okay, Whew. that's 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 a scary question because what that is expressing. Is, is doubt, is, well, I don't know if I should be doing this, but I'm going to go ahead. That is something that, that, that you don't want to do. You're not listening to the, to the whispers of your conscience there. Your conscience is bringing up the question. If, if the question is being brought up, that, that means in itself that... Um, that if you violate the question, you're in sin because you're not doing it out of faith. Um, the time will come, described in Revelation 13, when believers on earth at the time will be faced with a conscience-motivated eternal choice. And, and if you know the book of Revelation, chapter 13, it'll be to take the mark of the beast or... Uh, to be unable to buy, sell, eat, or finally even live. But praise God, if you have ex- re- received the sacrifice of Christ for your sins, you will not be faced with that choice. That's why we want to we wanna focus on, on the Lord taking us out of here before that time, as he promised. Um, so, so today, we have a whole universe of things that can cause other people to stumble, not just food and drink. Things like clothing style, movies, hunting, video games, books, alcohol, tobacco, worship styles, traditional holidays, eating at restaurants with shrines in the window, and more. We, we, went, to, we went to pho. It's P-H-O, but it's pronounced pho. 
Thai restaurant in town, no, Vietnamese restaurant in town. And uh, when we were finished on the way out, we realized that they have a, a big shrine of whatever gods they were, huh? Buddha, was it Buddha? Um, and, and had we noticed it uh, on the way in with a, a younger person or couple in the faith who had, who had questions about, wait a minute, this is, this is an idol here and they've got it in their front window. Should I, should I be eating here? Okay. And, and if, if, you are, if you have scruples about that and if you're concerned about that, don't do it. If your conscience says, no, I'm not going to eat here, don't eat here. And if you're the mature brother and you see this person has a little trouble, hey, hey let's go somewhere else. Uh, and that, that happens you know, in our world today. Um, so that's the kind of thing that, that we need to be focused on. So a believer can feel freedom and yet limit himself. That's a good thing. And now here's an important aspect of it. A mature Christian should also teach the less mature, weaker brother what Scripture says about any particular area. Not, not so the mature Christian can do whatever he wants, but that the weaker brother may no longer be trapped in his weakness. So, you know, if you're standing there and you see, you know, in front of the Vietnamese restaurant, a Buddha thing, that might be an opportunity for you to say, you know what, the Bible says that, that idols are nothing. We don't even know if this food was offered to the idol, but it's meaningless. Uh, so if, you know, if your conscience is clear, we can go ahead and do it. If it's not, we'll go somewhere else. Okay, that's what the older brother, the more mature brother, is called to do. Not just, not just condescend to the weaker, but teach the weaker. And it doesn't have to be right there. It can be, hey, remember last week we went to the Vietnamese place, blah, blah, blah. But at some point, we're called, we're called to strengthen the conscience of those. We're told to inform the conscience of those who are weaker. Um, Anything that a Christian will not give up for the sake of his conscience or the conscience of a weaker brother may be a symptom of the beginning of our own idolatry, which we don't want. Now, an imp uh, another important point. Not that the stronger brother should adjust his conscience. Okay, so, okay, this, this weaker brother is concerned about the Buddha statue we're not called to be, okay, I can be concerned about the Buddha statue too. No, I don't have to adjust my conscience. All I have to do is adjust my behavior to condescend to the lower um, and weaker brother. Um, okay. Let's go to uh, um, verse 26 through 29. Just read that real quick. Uh, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Let's just focus on that for a minute. Um, this is a quote from Psalm 24, 1. The thought, clear in the last clause of the verse, in Psalm 21, which is not quoted here, says, the world and those who dwell in it belong to the Lord. So that's extolling the universal sovereignty and graciousness of God over all people, Jew and Gentile. And in this context, Paul is focusing on what God has given us for food or drink and saying that it is good. Okay, so this is the basis where, where Paul says, hey, don't, no, don't worry about, don't even ask. God has provided this. It, it's provided for our good. Let's not worry about it. Um, and it's only the sinful thoughts and bodily excesses of sinful man that takes the good that God has provided and associates it with evil. And um, you, most of you know my chocolate chip cookie story, you know. Um, uh, I've, been, I've been trying to stay away from buffets, too, um, because I know that everything on those counters uh, has been provided by God and is good, and yet the abundance of it calls out to my to my sinful temptations. So um, we're to be aware of the snares that the world, the flesh, and the devil put in front of us and avoid them. Um, 
But the original context of Psalm 24, which extolling the power, holiness, and glory of God should cause us to be grateful for his provision. And then um, we remember uh, Peter uh, being, being confronted with a vision uh, of, of food being lowered on a blanket. Um, and the, the purpose of that vision was to teach Peter that, that the gospel can go to Gentiles, but God used the illustration of unclean food to prove that to him. And it's very interesting, and you can, you can go back and read that in, um, in, in the book of Acts, chapter 10, I believe. Yeah, chapter 10, 9 and following. Um, which we won't do today for the sake of time, but it's interesting, the word trance, it says Peter, Peter fell into a trance. And trance is really not the best word for that because our modern understanding of the word trance doesn't do justice to what Peter experienced. The Cambridge Dictionary about trance says a temporary mental condition which, in which someone is not completely conscious and or not in control of himself or herself. And then it gives some examples. But the word, the word translated um, uh, trance is the Greek word ecstasia. What does that sound like? Ecstasy, okay. Um, more, more, um, more accurately probably translated vision. Uh, although the vast majority of versions translated as trance, but vision would be better. Why? Because because Peter was not out of control or unconscious. Pe Peter was actually able to 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 interact with with the voice from heaven in this vision. So he wasn't out of control or unconscious. But the point is that, that God used what was considered unclean food under the Mosaic Covenant to get Peter to see that Gentiles should hear the gospel also. The image is that all people are made in the image of God and therefore under the New Covenant it is only the opinions and traditions of men that assess them as unclean. So, so you can, you can um, understand that in the context of Proverbs 24, uh, Psalm 24, uh, it talks about all things are from God and are good, including, uh, including Gentiles. So, uh, let's go to, um, to verse 30. If I partake with thankfulness, why am I slandered concerning that for which I give thanks? We should know the answer to that question that Paul asks here now that we've read that the Corinthian church was full of competition, divisions, factions, and the like. Okay, so Paul, Paul wasn't doing anything wrong. He was, he was eating food that God had provided and for which we're supposed to give thanks, but people were slandering him. People were saying, oh, Paul is, Paul is eating food sacrificed to idols. And, um, and Paul says, you know, why are you, why are you even asking about this? These people could have been Jewish legalists, similar to the ones we read about in Galatians, uh, making a charge that Paul is eating meat, but, but they obviously had not listened to what Paul was saying here. Paul had been belaboring that there's nothing to charge me about. My conscience is clear. Why are you accusing of something? Um, so Paul asked the questions to help, to help people consider their own thoughts and words. Um, in short, be concerned about your own biblically trained conscience. And we've talked about conscience several times. The issue is that your conscience has to be trained by the Word of God in order for you to make the right decisions, not be stumbled or cause anyone else to stumble. Uh, and the weaker brother, in general, has, a, has an uninformed 
conscience. They, they come into a situation with preconceived notions uh, that cause them to feel bad about a particular thing, food or whatever it is, but their conscience isn't biblically informed. And that's the job of the more mature brothers in this, in this group to come alongside them and say, okay, I understand your conscience has a problem with that. Let's see what the Word of God says. So, um, of course, God will be the perfect judge knowing the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. Now, um, to wrap up, the issue is much broader than food sacrificed to idols. Um, and, and one of the ways that we, that we broaden the issue, and, and I thank God that over the last couple of years, some people have come to me when we have pot, potlucks, and they said, uh, David, I've been thinking about bringing in a pork roast. Is that okay with you? Well, that's, that's very kind. That's very considerate. That's doing exactly what Paul is telling people to do. Check with someone who might be a weaker brother, who has a scruple in a particular area, and if he does, don't offend him. Limit your own liberty. Okay? Uh, so I, so I, thank, I thank God for that. Um, I, also, I also thank God for those of you who have chosen to limit your liberty with love in the case of my wife, Aurora, by, by, not, by not wearing this, the, the scents and things that, uh, or using them around a building that bother her. That's another way that we can limit our liberty with love. Um, general principles, four of them. Having the right to do something does not mean we should do it in every circumstance, regardless of, it, of its effects on others. Number two, Believers' liberty in Christ can and should be voluntarily limited in order not to cause a weaker brother to sin by violating his conscience. And we've got to remember that, that a stumbling block is in fact something that is intentionally made to be attractive, not just a rock in the path that we may or may not trip over. Number three, maintain the unity of, unity of the Spirit and the bond of love. Uh, and that may call a believer to give up his personal right to something. And th this, whole, this whole book, basically, because the Corinthians were, were torn apart over, over any number of things, this, this whole book is focusing on unity. Remember last week or the week before we talked about the purpose of giving up your stuff is for the unity of the body. Um, so Psalm 133, how good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. And then the last, la last point, we should avoid anything that would tempt a weak Christian or that would make an unsaved person feel more at ease in his sin. And that, that's kind of a little nuanced, but it's an important point. Um, if an unsaved person is doing something sinful, we, we should not be changing our behavior in order to make that person feel more comfortable in what they're doing. That's not the same category as we, as we talked about here. Here we're talking about a weaker brother or sister. Okay. Up to a point, you change your behavior, to condescend to their conscience, and then you teach them. You don't do the same thing with an unbeliever. You don't change your, your behavior, go against your conscience, in order to make an unbeliever feel more comfortable in their sin. So, we've got, uh, we've got the glory of God next week, focusing on that. And um, Michael, I thank you for for bringing that up again during the prayer time. So we're thinking about that and, uh, and asking the question with, with sober judgment, in what way do I bring glory to God in my life or fail to? So thank you, Lord, for your word. Work in us to conform us to it. Lord, give us a hunger to be pleasing to you, not just going through the motions, Lord, give us a desire to be constantly examining ourselves. Lord, we read back in Peter, the end of all things is near. 
Lord, help us to live our lives in acknowledgement of that, recognizing that it's time to put away childish things and work for your kingdom, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to the YouTube channel of Desert Ridge Baptist Church in St. George, Utah. I'm Michael Waldrop, one of the pastors here at DRBC. We strive for sound doctrine and preaching and teaching and warm fellowship around biblical truth. For more info about DRBC, please visit our website, drbc.us. There you can find helpful links as well as a secure means for contributing financially to our ministry here in this area. Soli Deo Gloria.